you very much. I'd like to thank you for the occasion of uh, presenting some work here, which is joined with Paul Arne Oestwer. And uh, yeah, many of it benefited from discussions with Markus Spitzweg. Um, what I want to do um, is the following. Um, yeah, first of first of all, I have to um, disappoint everyone who is interested about um, two not being invertible. So let's take something, an Ethereum scheme, over the integers with two inverted. And then there is work, which of course goes back to Karubi, but yeah, sort of the, the first explicit construction has been given by Jens von Bostel, and of course this owes also a lot to work of Marco Schlichting, um, and probably I have to add a few more names, um, but I won't. Um, there is uh, some object, KQ, which is a P1 spectrum. And this P1 spectrum represents Hermitian K-theory. And you all heard at least, well, you, you had the chance to hear three lectures about it, the lectures that Marco gave. Um, so this here represents Hermitian K-theory. And this is also known as higher grotendieck witt groups. Um, and I was asked to present um, work which discusses a certain filtration on, on this P1 spectrum. So, and uh, this, uh, this sort of filtration is the slice filtration, which is due to Wawatsky. Um, so the aim is discuss its slices and this means that I will try to follow the following um, program. The first one would be an introduction to Wawatsky's slice filtration. Yeah, and this also means that I will explain what P1 spectra are as you've seen in Björn's talk, things he has not touched upon, so one of the things he has not touched upon is motivic homotopy theory, but I'm not going to give an introduction to motivic homotopy theory, don't be afraid. Uh, I'll be very, uh, very rough on that. Um, then, once I've introduced this, I will describe slices of some P1 spectra, including um, this here. Oh, no, there's three first. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, well, this here is sort of ab just about the single chunks, uh, but they are connected in a certain way, and we, I mean, uh, we sort of know the sort of the first step, which is the slice differentials. For, for the spectrum, and this allows you to uh, make some computations and get some applications. And this will be then the end. Uh, probably, I should say that sort of in connection with these applications, um, yeah, when I was asked to give these, these talks, uh, I thought, okay, this is all fine. But um, in last month, Tom Bachmann posted a preprint on the archive which discusses the very effective slice filtration on Hermitian K theory. This here is sort of the effective filtration that I will discuss, and from a certain perspective, it is an uh, ineffective filtration. Uh, I, I might mention Tom Bachmann's, or I should mention Tom Bachmann's work here as well. So, this is roughly for my two talks. I have to talk again, or I, I'm very pleased to talk again tomorrow. <laughs> um, I should sort of cover these two parts uh, today. Okay, and feel free to interrupt me. Um, 
I should start by discussing the slice filtration, right? Um, so the slice filtration. Ah, I forgot. Okay. So I said here S is some um, Noetherian finite dimensional base scheme, but um, most of the time this will be fairly uninteresting or fairly small. It will be the spectrum of a field. And then, well, as you can guess, the characteristic is not two, um, at least when we get to to the spectrum here. Okay, the slice filtration uh, takes pla part in the morel wawotsky P1 stable homotopy category of this base scheme S. Um, yeah, and I will just, following tradition, when I define a category, I will just describe its objects and not the morphisms. So, an object in this category is a P1 spectrum. And being a P1 spectrum means the following. Uh, you have a sequence and these single guys are simple Chopri sheaves on a side of smooth schemes over S. I'll write this down. And this comes with bonding maps from um, the P1 suspension of the N to the N plus first part. And EN, as I just said, so this here is the category of smooth uh, schemes over S. So when S is a field, these are just can think of these as smooth varieties over F, contravariant with values in the category of pointed simplicial sets. Um, and of course, whenever you have a smooth uh, variety over S, a smooth S scheme, it gives you a representable functor, which is discrete, but you can think of it as a sort of yeah, simplicial set nevertheless. But there's one issue, which for topologists is uh, usually not an issue. Uh, things might not have base points. Yeah, you might not have an F rational point. So when you do this UNIDA embedding, make sure you add a disjoint base point. So this will, is this here readable? Yeah? I should not go below that, right? Not okay. Um, let's see. Maybe maybe like this. So here are some um, examples. If you have a smooth S scheme, so I should actually write down some morphism to S, but yeah. Um, I'll write it down this way. Then you get a suspension spectrum. Here's x with a disjoint base point. This means that you start with x plus, and then you have x plus smash p1, and you have x plus smash p1 smash p1, and so on. And you have these bonding maps, and the bonding maps are all identities. Um, OK, so this gives us already uh, plenty of objects in here. But here's something more interesting, KGL. Um, so KGL, ah, no, no, I forgot something. Um, sorry. Here's the sort of the smallest variety you can think of. That's this here. And I will into, oh, yeah? P1 um, is also of this type. Yeah, um, it's the pre-sheaf represented by the projective line P1 over S, equipped with the base point, for example, at infinity. And right, I should explain what the the smash is. Um, so for any sort of two pre-sheaves. Um, which have base points, the smash is defined as the product 
divided by the one point union. Okay? Um, so you can think of it as the uh, sort of the, the scheme wise smash product in pointed simplicial sets. Okay. Oh, thank you. This, this uh, reminds me that I should always ask, not always, but often ask for questions. Are there further questions? I'm very flexible. Yeah? But of course, when you want to introduce the morphisms, I would have to say something about the Nitsnevich topology, or about localizing A1, all these things. I sort of intended to not mention these details unless you want me to. And of course I can, I'm happy to. But I'm sort of, I was trying to um, give you a few formal properties of this slice filtration and then play along with it for some time. Okay. Um, yeah. Ah, right, right. Um, so I want to confuse you by giving you many names for this object, this, this particular one. So here's one name. And this name is chosen because it's the unit for the symmetric monoidal product on this category, uh, the, the uh, motivic stable homotopy category. And I'm usually lazy and I don't write down the index S, but sometimes it will be interesting to distinguish uh, what base scheme you're actually taking. And I might also call this simply S0,0. Zero. So the zero zeros here. Yeah, these are many, many names for the thing defined over here. Yeah. So this is a uh, unit. Um, I wanted to give you a more interesting example, right, of a P1 spectrum. And actually, when you look at it, you will notice that it, it looks kind of constant um, because I'm going to write down the same thing here. Uh, all the time. Um, and then there is some, some structure map. Maybe I should explain this here first. In some sense, you have seen this here already um, in Marco Schlichting's talk. So I look at a specific simplicial pre-sheaf. And it is the one that gives us algebraic K-theory, or I could be more specific, Thomas and Trobot K-theory, or Waldhausen K-theory. So whenever you have some smooth thing over S, um, you can look at, yeah, let, let me write down something um, maybe naive. Um, you can look at vector bundles over X uh, and use this as your exact category uh, and then, for example, apply Waldhausen's S dot construction to it and realize this and take the loop space. And, uh, well, um, there are, of course, variants of this construction where you take instead uh, uh, perfect complexes of uh, over X. Um, anyhow, I only want, want here something uh, which gives me the algebraic K groups of X. And you might argue that the way I wrote it down, it is not uh, pre sheaf because it's not strictly functorial, but there's a way to fix this. And I'm not going to worry about this too much. But, oh, I forgot something, as always. Uh, I have to describe the structure map. And this is actually very nice, because as you've also seen in, in Marco's talk, K-theory has a ring structure. Did he explain this? I wasn't here this morning. Did he explain the ring structure? No, he did not. Okay. Uh, don't worry. Of course, it has a ring structure. Oh, no, but it was in Björn's talk, yeah? 
K theory is something is a ring spectrum. You said it. Okay. We have a ring structure. Excellent. So we can multiply with something. And here you multiply with a certain class in K0 of P, P1. And this is the following class. You take O minus O of minus 1. Yeah? Considered as a class in K0 of P1. Yeah? You multiply with this, let me call it, tau. And this describes the bonding map. I'm indicating that there is a periodicity here. Yeah. This is similar to the bot periodicity you see in complex K theory. But of course, the spaces you have there are BU times Z and then U and then BU times C and then U. So here I'm sort of skipping every second space. And this that I'm skipping is basically due to the fact that P1 is a two-one sphere, so the complex points are a two-sphere, not a one-sphere. Yes, yes, in some sense this is what happens. Um, in order to sort of connect with this, there's a result due to Morel and Mowatsky, which says that we can describe this pre-sheaf in a different way up to A1 homotopy theory. This is the same as C times BGL infinity. And there's a more geometric description up to A1 homotopy. And this is given by Z times the infinite Grossmannian. Yeah. So, where is, the, where is the plus con? No, you don't. Um, let's see. Do you, okay, shall I give more examples of P1 spectra, or are we at a level where I should actually explain more about the homotopy theory of these objects? <laughs> hmm? I should go to some homotopy theory. Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, so what, what happens here is the following. If I look at this homotopy category over the complex numbers, I can take, um, I have a functor which takes uh, complex points, um, complex Betty realization. So this is induced by sending x in smooth over c to um, its complex points with the analytic topology. Um, and when you look at the complex points of KGL, uh, you get KU. And if you happen to be over the real numbers, there is a similar functor where X sends to, is sent to its real points with the real analytic topology. Um, okay, and since I'm giving two lectures, I have the option of giving you exercises, and we'll discuss these tomorrow, right? I don't know if you want to have exercises. Do you know what this here is? Okay, no idea. But 
Oh, I can, I can. This is a very coarse thing. I can look at the complex points with its complex conjugation action and then look at its uh, sort of geometric fixed points. That is the same as what is happening here. Geometric. If I want it to be collimate co preserving. Pardon? Uh, do, do you want to answer what this is? Huh? Okay. The thing is, if you're asked in a talk something, and this talk is not related to the subject that you're working on, and you're still asked, this means that there's probably a very simple answer, and the simplest answer that you can think of is zero. Yeah? Yes. Yes, yes. That's one explanation. Another explanation is that the, the structure map that you get here uh, corresponds to, under its real points, to the, the first Hopf map eta, which is near potent. Yeah? If you iterate it, on the and this is what happens because this is the, the structure map, yeah? then it becomes the zero spectrum. Although the spaces are not trivial, the bonding map is, is zero. I uh, I can define this functor to land in a genuine C2 spectrum. And w what I described here is what happens to the generators of this category. And then I say I want this to be sort of the triangulated column preserving um, extension. And from this you basically get that you get the geometric fixed points. Then. Okay? Okay. Um, so maybe I can give uh, at least one more example, so that I actually have this KQ thing on the board. Um, but I won't discuss it in detail because um, I will just refer to Marco Schlichting's talk. So the KQ that I mentioned can be be described as GW zero. GW1, GW2, GW3, and so on, plus certain structure maps. And these presheaves uh, with values and spaces are the ones that Marco Schlichting introduced. Actually, he didn't introduce them as presheaves, he only said this is your value at some ring or maybe some DG category or whatever. Yeah, but you can turn this into a into a presheaf. Um, yeah. And then this here um, represents the, the higher gold deep bit groups. Okay. Ah, yeah. And if I want to say that this object represents something in this category, I actually have to say something about the morphisms. Yeah, unfortunately. So, uh, um, okay, let me say something about the morphisms. Um, so, I'd like to do this as a process. Um, basically basically in in two steps so let's do homotopy theory in the category of factors here um, with values in pointed simplicial sets and I want this homotopy theory to satisfy the following um, um, properties. Um, the first one, but, but it should come as last. Let's see. Let's let me uh, state it as the first one. Nevertheless, a one should parameterize homotopies. And this basically means that you force A1 to be contractible um, 
And the base point here is, in fact, our terminal base scheme S here. Yeah, this is one condition that we want to have. And then uh, there is another condition, uh, which is that every object in here um, satisfies the Snevich descent up to homotopy. Yes, and this is actually a sort of a crucial point. I, I mean, I can define uh, what the Nisnevich topology is precisely, if you want me to. The, the first thing I always say, I usually say, when I explain this is, it sits between the Zariski and the Etal topology. No? These are slightly more familiar, although that's about to change. Um, and... Uh, it sits precisely at the right spot um, because um, what you see here from K-theory and also Hermitian K-theory, KQ, um, the spaces in there, they satisfy Nisnevich descent, but they do not satisfy Etal descent. This is what the quillen lichtenbaum conjecture is about. Yeah? So we should not go to the Etal topology this, if we want to discuss K-theory. Uh, the risky topology, pardon? Well, at, at some point, the Nisnevich topology will be more familiar than the, yeah? I can, I can use other topologies if we want me to, yeah? <laughs> LDH is actually relevant, but I, I won't uh, introduce this. Okay, um... What did I want to say? Ah, right. Why should we not just stick to the Zariski topology, yeah. which is just given by open, open subsets, open subschemes? This is much easier. Uh, the thing is, uh, we want our smooth schemes to behave like smooth manifolds in differential topology. For example, we would like to have something like tubular neighborhoods. And this does not work in the Zariski topology, but it works in the Nisnevich topology. So if you have a uh, closed embedding, so this is my sign for a closed embedding. This is, this is basically the motivation for this here. I is my closed embedding of smooth things over S. Um, then it has a normal bundle. And if you collapse the complement of Z, I should really write I of C, then this is equivalent, um, when you set up the homotopy theory correctly, to the tome space of the normal bundle of I. And the tome space is what you think it is if you don't have a metric available, and you don't in general. Uh, you take the total space and you collapse the complement of the zero section. Yes. This I do not know. But what I know is that the smooth schemes are generators. Yeah. And you may insert smooth proper in the case of a field of characteristic zero. Right. Uh, I guess you all have attended last lectures where he said we desperately need to work for singular objects and well he's not here, right? Th that's the thing. I mean this is for smooth schemes. He's not interested. I'm sorry about this, but this is for for smooth schemes. I should really watch what I'm saying since I'm being monitored, right? <laughs> 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 
So there are other topologies, and if you work over a field of positive characteristic, then the LDH topology is a different topology, which sort of allows you to do similar things, provided you're willing to invert the characteristic of the base field. But um, there are some technicalities involved, and I do not want to address this. Let's see. Um, let me give you um, one example. Projective line is covered by two affine lines, the intersection being the affine line minus zero. And since we force this here to be contractible, you can think of this here as being the suspension of this here. More generally, you can, uh, for example, deal with punctured affine spaces. Yeah? You can also co cover these as some sort of smaller uh, affine space minus zero times a, a one minus zero and so on. Yeah? So there, uh, there are things you can do uh, and they sort of justify the following notation. Um, so P1 uh, no, sorry, a1 minus 0, this has a canonical base point, 1. Um, so it's a pointed object, and I call it the 1-1 one, one sphere. Um, and P1, sort of being its suspension, um, um, this is then a 2-1 sphere. And in general, you can then show that this here, uh, now I get confused, um, this is a 2n minus 1, uh, comma, n sphere. Yeah. So we have a bunch of spheres available. Uh, and the passage to the stable situation is to um, make smashing with, with P1, smashing with this sphere to be invertible. Right. Yes, this is the classical sphere that helps. It's the, the associated pre sheaf is constant, value being simplicial S1. And it's the one that we use sort of when we smash with for our triangulated structure. Um, okay, so P1 spectra um, serve to invert smashing with P1. Okay. So when we pass to P1 spectra with the appropriate notion of stable equivalences, we get the P1 stable homotopy category over S. And inside there, we have a whole uh, bunch of spheres, S, S, comma, T, where S and T are both integers. And since we inverted sort of S to 1, uh, we also have this here inverted, since it's a triangulated category, um, we're good to play with all types of spheres. Um, and, yeah, maybe just for, for notation. No, I'm having a problem because I'm too short. So this is then my suspension notation. And, well, I did not really explain the morphisms, but I set up the notation uh, to explain these representability statements. For example sigma s comma t of some smooth s scheme mapping to kgl 
uh, here you take the morphisms in the stable homotopy category. This is then the same as the algebraic K group. Let me see. This is S minus 2T of X. And let's assume S regular here. If not, then this also describes a k version of K-theory, but homotopy K-theory, Chuck Weibel's homotopy K-theory. And this um, if we use KQ, let me just uh, sort of single out um, of two parts. Here's orthogonal K theory. Um, what do I have to write here? This doesn't seem correct. Well, maybe this here is. Um, so this here is for t congruent to 0 mod 4. And so this is orthogonal k-theory, and this here is symplectic k-theory. And again, I can refer to Björn's talk, where he said that all the rest of the workshop is about involutions. But actually, uh, I didn't mention an involution. It's the trivial involution that I'm using on on my base. Yeah, so. Right. Okay, I have to introduce um, at least one other P1 spectrum, but maybe I'll introduce the slice filtration first. I take the uh, localizing full subcategory. Of the stable homotopy category over S generated by the following options. I take suspension spectra of smooth schemes over S. So um, this process of inverting P1, this tells us basically that if you take suspension spectra of smooth schemes as well as their desuspensions with respect to P1, they generate the whole category. And here I'm just looking at this chunk where I do not allow the desuspensions with respect to P1. I allow desuspensions with respect to S1, the usual circle. So this here is a triangulated subcategory, and it's not all of um, all of the motivic stable homotopy category. In fact, I can take any integer n, and and I can define S H of n of S to yes, yes. Um. 
So here I take some integer and I allow myself to uh, suspend the generators with respect to this integer. And SH effective, that's what the F stands for, uh, is then SH zero. And we have an inclusion, IN, full inclusion by construction. And there's a general result by Niemann saying that this here has a right adjoint. And this is compactly generated. Um, and this gives us the slice filtration. The end part of the filtration is then the composition. I first look at the part which is generated by n-fold suspensions of smooth uh, schemes over S. I consider this n in the whole category. And of course, I have a canonical map from Fn plus 1 to here. And then I take the cone, and this is the nth slice. Um. So this is a triangulated functor. And this here is the canonical map you can think of, yeah, just by playing with the junctions. Yeah. OK. And what might be slightly surprising if you dealt with triangulated categories is that this is actually a functor. But the reason is that um, uh, the this filtration is built such that the nth slice, ah, the nth slice is right orthogonal to the n plus 1 effective guys. This is basically the reason for, for this being a functor. Um, OK. Um, I should right, um, I should say one thing. Since this year takes place at the Hausdorff Research Institute, right, you get a filtration on the stable homotopy category, which is exhaustive. You know, you know what's coming already, yeah? So, okay. So it's exhaustive, um, but not Hausdorff. And. An example will come up of a P1 spectrum, which is in SHN for every n, but which is not contractible. And at this point, you may already wonder why we even bother to deal with this if this is such an ineffective filtration, if it's not, not Hausdorff. But there are some reasons. And, well, one reason was mentioned by Lars in his talk. Before I come to sort of concrete things, maybe one more general statement, if you sort of like this um, type of general statements. So pillar, pillar is thesis, and joint work of mine with Javier Gutierrez, Markus Spitzweg, and Paul Anne Oestwer shows that um, the slice filtration is multiplicative.
In particular, you get maps from the nth slice uh, of a ring spectrum smash the nth slice to the n plus n slice of this ring spectrum. And this will come in handy when we discuss some examples. And I should also mention uh, one, one lemma, which basically follows from its construction. Um, if you want to compute the n plus first filtration of a 1-1 one -one suspension of something, that's the same as the 1-1 one -one suspension of the nth filtration of this something, and same for the slice. Yeah, this will, will come in handy at some point. Um, okay, let me get to the second part. So here's another P1 spectrum that, well, we need it. There's no way around it. Um, and that's this here. And it represents motivic cohomology. Um, and yeah, this is um, it, this came up in in last talk. Um, let me just describe its slices. This is a theorem which is due to Mark Levine and Wawatsky. The slices are very simple. The nth slice of the motivic Arnberg McLean spectrum is itself if n is zero and otherwise it's contractible. Yeah. And I mean this sort of at least one part can be proved very easily once you know that this represents motivic cohomology in the following sense, if you compute maps from an ST suspension of a smooth scheme, um, oh, oh, okay, from now on, um, the base is a field. Okay, so if you have something smooth over a field, you map into here, uh, this computes H minus s comma minus t of x with coefficients in z. And there was a sort of different notation which came up in Lars Hesselholtz's talk, um, which is this here. And since motivic cohomology of a smooth uh, variety over a field is trivial in if this here is negative, and we see that sort of its, its first effective cover, the F1, vanishes. Um, and this is basically one half of the proof, and the other half is fairly complicated because you have to prove that it's effective. This is fairly clear in characteristic zero because you can build it using symmetric powers on varieties. Um, there's one thing, if you take a symmetric power of a smooth variety, there's no guarantee that it's smooth again. Uh, so this is where characteristic zero sort of enters. But this holds for every field. Um, yes. yes. Uh, including characteristic two. And of course it extends um, then also to other coefficients instead of the, the integers. Um, and sort of from this I could already build one example which shows that this filtration is not Hausdorff. Uh, but I would rather discuss the slices of algebraic K theory. This is also true for every field, also characteristic two. And the n slice of KGL is a 2n n suspension of the Allenbeck-McLean spectrum, 
This is true for every n. And I can rephrase this using the multiplicative structure as follows. The graded slice of K-theory is a Laurent polynomial ring over the unbeck maclean spectrum on one generator. And the degree of this generator is 2, 1. Yeah. And this is very similar to the situation in topology where you have the homotopy groups of complex K-theory being, being described uh, in this way. So fortunately, Marco explained many things about the relations between Hermitian K-theory and algebraic K-theory. And um, I want to express these in, in the setup. Um, which, ah, no, there's one thing I should say, of course, to tie this in with, with uh, Lars' talk. Um, and, of course, this fits in the, in the general slice filtration setup. If you have this filtration on this, this category, of course, you get spectral sequences out of it. Yeah. And particularly, you get one spectral sequence for algebraic K-theory, with input being motivic cohomology, and this is the motivic spectral sequence. So this is one way to construct it. And as Lars said, we would like to have it in a generality, and maybe Björn would agree that we want to have it for the sphere spectrum and similar um, brave new rings. But yeah, um, I'll uh, stick to this easy case. Um, right. So in order to deal with... Um, with uh, slices um, on Hermitian K-theory, I would like to use the following properties. And most of the proof can be derived from this simple, well, yeah, this list of properties. Uh, so, there is a forgetful map. Called F. Okay, now there's a notation conflict with the F from the slice filtration. I apologize. But this should be clear. This is the forgetful map. And this here classifies um, vector bundles with some extra structure, and F forgets the extra, extra structure. Um, this is the forgetful map. And this is actually, um, we don't need this, the, the full statement, this is a map of ring P1 spectrum. And there's also a different map, and this is called the hyperbolic map. This is not a map of ring spectra, but it's a map of KQ modules. And believe it or not, I just discussed this, this map, in some sense, in my master's course, um, which I gave this morning. So this is the reason for the lectures being switched. I had to teach, because basically everyone who could fill in for me in Osnabrück is already here. Um, yeah. Um, so I gave a lecture, and what it, uh, the master course is on quadratic forms, and we discussed the hyperbolic space associated to some vector space. So this is what happens here. Um, and you can now compose and get two other maps. And this composition can be described as follows. This is multiplication with 
an endomorphism of the, the unit of the sphere. And this element in the sphere has the name 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon is induced um, by the twist isomorphism on this smash product. Okay. Um, ah, and then we have the other composition. So we take the hyperbolic thing and we forget the hyperbolic form. So what happens here is that you take a vector bundle and associate associate to it the direct sum of the vector bundle and its dual vector bundle. So there's a fancy description of this here, which is it's psi 1 plus psi minus 1, where psi 1 is just the identity atoms operation and psi minus 1 is, to my knowledge, the only explicit non-trivial atoms operation, which is stable. Is this true? No one objects? Okay, good. So. Okay, so we have good control over these maps, but one more thing is true, and... Yes, yes. Hmm? It's take taking the dual because I don't have an involution. I mean, you can discuss this more generally, but I prefer not to. Ah, actually, uh, from now on, of course, uh, um, where two is invertible, okay? Because, I mean, there's a candidate for this spectrum over any base, but we don't know what it represents, so. At least I don't know. Maybe you know. Um, Ah, one, one more thing, and then also my time is up, uh, I guess. So there's, there's a very interesting element, um, which is eta. So this goes from a 3-2 sphere, which can be thought of it as A2 minus 0, which maps canonically to P1, which is a 2-1 sphere. We have this element... And this is an endomorphism of our unit of by degree 1, 1. And we can multiply with it. And the following happens when we multiply on KQ. Take the cone, it's KGL, such that this here is the forgetful map. And then it extends to a sigma 2, 1 KQ. And this here, actually, by bot periodicity, is the same as sigma to 1 KGL. And this here is sigma to 1 of the hyperbolic map. So we have this cofiber sequence, which in topology is probably due to wood. Um, and if I am informed correctly, I missed Marco's talk, unfortunately, this morning, but he explained this sequence sort of on the level of uh, DG categories. Yeah. So these are the, the basic building blocks that I will use to compute the slices of Hermitian K-theory up to a little thing, and for this little thing we have to work a bit harder. So, thank you. The complex points of KQ uh, gives you KO. Any guesses? No. no it's Any guesses? The thing is, I didn't describe the structure map for, for K, K, uh, Q, but uh, sort of um, 
Yeah, uh, it gives you the multiplication by two map. And uh, this gives you KO with two inverted, the real points. Do, do you want me to write this down? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, we have the Betty realization for KQ. This is KO, topological K theory. And we have the real realization of KQ. This is KO with two inverted, which is a non-trivial spectrum. Although it's it's considerably simpler than KO. Yes, yes. Uh, it's the one that you think it is. <laughs> yes. If I really want to discuss, I mean, if I want to discuss smash products properly, I need some decent model. Some, for example, if we want symmetric spectra, would work well. Uh, so I'm I'm really uh, this goes way beyond. Ah, so the the question was, um, or the the observation was that this looks some kind of Mackey structure, and how this relates to. Mackey structures uh, in for motivic Z2 spectra, and I don't know much about motivic Z2 spectra, but there are experts in the audience. Uh, shall I mention some names, Paul? Or <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, the thing is, yeah, yeah. No, I haven't really thought about this. The the relation. I'm I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, this uh, is then a minus one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the real points is one because uh, the, I mean the, the real points of the one one sphere, that's a zero sphere. Because the real line, minus zero. Well, it's just this here. And if you twist the, the smash product on the zero sphere with itself, that's the identity. But for the one sphere, it's not. <laughs> 